Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Steve Jobs. Steve and Paul Jobs was an American entrepreneur, businessman, inventor, and industrial designer. He was the co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Apple Inc. CEO and majority shareholder of Pixar. A member of the Walt Disney Company's board of directors following its acquisition of Pixar and founder, chairman, and CEO of Next. Jobs and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak are widely recognized as pioneers of the microcomputer revolution of the 1970s and 1980s. Jobs was born in San Francisco to Syrian parents who had to put him up for adoption at birth. He was raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. During the 1960s, Jobs briefly attended Reed College in 1972 before dropping out. He then decided to travel through India in 1974 seeking enlightenment and studying Zen Buddhism. Jobs' declassified FBI report stated that an acquaintance knew that Jobs had used the illegal drugs marijuana and LSD while he was in college. Jobs once told a reporter that taking LSD was one of the two or three most important things he did in his life. Jobs and Wozniak co-founded Apple in 1976 to sell Wozniak's Apple I personal computer. The visionaries gained fame and wealth a year later for the Apple II, one of the first highly successful mass-produced personal computers. In 1979, after a tour of Park, Jobs saw the commercial potential of the Xerox Salto, which was mouse-driven and had a graphical user interface. This led to development of the unsuccessful Apple Lisa in 1983, followed by the breakthrough Macintosh in 1984. In addition to being the first mass-produced computer with a GUI, the Macintosh introduced the sudden rise of the desktop publishing industry in 1985. With the addition of the Apple Laser Writer, the first laser printer to feature vector graphics. Following a long power struggle, Jobs was forced out of Apple in 1985. After leaving Apple, Jobs took a few of its members with him to found Next, a computer platform development company specializing in state-of-the-art computers for higher education and business markets. In addition, Jobs helped to initiate the development of the visual effects industry when he funded the spin-out of the computer graphics division of George Lucas Lucasfilm in 1986. The new company, Pixar, would eventually produce the first fully computer-animated film, Toy Story, an event made possible in part because of Jobs' financial support. In 1997, Apple merged with Next. Within a few months of the merger, Jobs became CEO of his former company reviving Apple at the verge of bankruptcy. Beginning in 1997, with the Think Different advertising campaign, Jobs worked closely with designer Jonathan Ive to develop a line of products that would have larger cultural ramifications, the iMac, iTunes, and iTunes Store, Apple Store, iPod, iPhone, App Store, and the iPad. In 2001, the original Mac OS was replaced with a completely new Mac OS X, based on Next's Next Step platform, giving the OS a modern Unix-based foundation for the first time. Jobs was diagnosed with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in 2003 and died on October 5, 2011, of respiratory arrest related to the tumor. Parents Steve Jobs' biological father, Abdul Fattah, John, Jandali, grew up in Homs, Syria, and was born into an Arab Muslim household. Jandali is the son of a self-made millionaire who did not go to college, and a mother who was a traditional housewife. While an undergraduate at the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, he was a student activist and spent time in jail 
for his political activities. Although Dandali initially wanted to study law, he eventually decided to study economics and political science. He pursued a Ph.D. in the latter subject at the University of Wisconsin, where he met Joanne Carol Schiebel, a Catholic of Swiss and German descent, who grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. As a doctoral candidate, Jandali was a teaching assistant for a course Schiebel was taking, although both were the same age. Job's full biological sister notes that her maternal grandparents were not happy that their daughter was dating Jan Dali. It wasn't that he was Middle Eastern so much as that he was a Muslim. But there are a lot of Arabs in Michigan and Wisconsin, so it's not that unusual. Walter Isaacson, Steve Jobs' official biographer, additionally states that Schiebel's father threatened to cut Joanne off completely, if she continued the relationship. Jobs' adoptive father, Paul Reinhold Jobs, grew up in a Calvinist household, the son of an alcoholic and sometimes abusive father. The family lived on a farm in Germantown, Wisconsin. Paul bore an ostensible resemblance to James Dean, he had tattoos, dropped out of high school and traveled around the Midwest for several years during the 1930s looking for work. He eventually joined the United States Coast Guard as an engine room machinist. After World War II, Paul Jobs decided to leave the Coast Guard. When his ship docked in San Francisco, he made a bet that he would find his wife in San Francisco, and promptly went on a blind date with Clara Hagopian. They were engaged ten days later, and married in 1946. Clara, the daughter of Armenian immigrants, grew up in San Francisco, and had been married before, but her husband had been killed in the war. After a series of moves, Paul and Clara settled in San Francisco's Sunset District in 1952. As a hobby, Paul Jobs rebuilt cars, but his career was as a repo man, which suited his aggressive, tough personality. Meanwhile, their attempts to start a family were halted after Clara had an ectopic pregnancy, leading them to consider adoption in 1955. Birth Schiebel became pregnant in 1954 when she and Jan Dali spent the summer with his family in Homs, Syria. Jan Dali has stated that he was very much in love with Joanne, but sadly, her father was a tyrant and forbade her to marry me, as I was from Syria, and so she told me she wanted to give the baby up. For adoption, Jobs told his official biographer that Schiebel's father was dying at the time. Schiebel did not want to aggravate him, and both felt that at 23 they were too young to marry. In addition, as there was a strong stigma against bearing a child out of wedlock and raising it as a single mother, and as abortions were illegal and dangerous. Adoption was the only option women had in the United States in 1954. According to Jan Dali, Schiebel deliberately did not involve him in the process without telling me, Joanne upped and left to move to San Francisco to have the baby without anyone knowing, including me. She did not want to bring shame onto the family and thought this was the best. For everyone, Schiebel put herself in the care of a doctor who sheltered unwed mothers, delivered their babies, and quietly arranged closed adoptions. Schiebel gave birth to Jobs on February 24, 1955, in San Francisco and chose an adoptive couple. For him that was Catholic, well-educated, and wealthy. The couple changed their mind, however, and decided to adopt a girl instead. The baby boy was then placed with the Bay Area blue-collar couple Paul and Clara Jobs, neither of whom had a college education, and Schiebel refused to sign the adoption papers. She then took the matter to court in an attempt to have her baby placed with a different family and only consented to releasing the baby to Paul. 
and Clara after they promised that he would attend college. When Steve Jobs was in high school, his mother Clara admitted to his girlfriend, 17-year-old Chris Ann Brennan, that she was too frightened to love Steve for the first six months of his life. I was scared they were going to take him away from me. Even after we won the case, Steve was so difficult a child that by the time he was two I felt we had made a mistake. I wanted to return him. When Chris Ann shared his mother's comment with Steve, he stated that he was already aware of that and would later say he was deeply loved and indulged by Paul and Clara. Many years later, Steve Jobs' wife Laureen also noted that he felt he had been really blessed by having the two of them as parents. Jobs would become upset when Paul and Clara were referred to as adoptive parents, as they were my parents 1000%. With regard to his biological parents, Jobs referred to them as my sperm and egg bank. That's not harsh. It's just the way it was, a sperm bank thing. Nothing more. Jan Dali has also stated that I really am not his dad. Mr. and Mrs. Jobs are, as they raised him, and I don't want to take their place. Childhood Paul and Clara adopted Job's sister Patricia in 1957 and the family moved to Mountain View, California in 1961. It was during this time that Paul built a workbench in his garage for his son in order to pass along his love of mechanics. Jobs, meanwhile, admired his father's craftsmanship because he knew how to build anything. If we needed a cabinet, he would build it. When he built our fence, he gave me a hammer so I could work with him. I wasn't that into fixing cars, but I was eager to hang out with my dad. By the time he was 10, Jobs was deeply involved in electronics and befriended many of the engineers who lived in the neighborhood. He had difficulty making friends with children his own age, however, and was seen by his classmates as a loner that served as the original site of all though may of Paul and Clara Jobs on Chris Drive in Los Altos, California. Jobs had difficulty functioning in a traditional classroom, tended to resist authority figures, frequently misbehaved and was suspended a few times. Clara had taught him to read as a toddler, and Jobs stated that he was pretty bored in school and had turned into a little terror. You should have seen us in the third grade. We basically destroyed the teacher. He frequently played pranks on others. At Monteloma Elementary School in Mountain View, his father Paul never reprimanded him, however, and instead blamed the school for not placing enough challenge on his brilliant son. Jobs would later credit his fourth grade teacher, Imogen Teddy Hill, with turning him around, she taught an advanced fourth grade class and it took her about a month to get hit to my situation. She bribed me into learning. She would say, I really want you to finish this workbook. I'll give you five bucks if you finish it. That really kindled a passion in me for learning things. I learned more that year than I think I learned in any other year in school. They wanted me to skip the next two years in grade school and go straight to junior high to learn a foreign language. But my parents very wisely wouldn't let it happen. Jobs skipped the fifth grade and transferred to the sixth grade at Crittenden Middle School in Mountain View, where he became a socially awkward loner. Jobs was often bullied and gave his parents an ultimatum, they had to either take him out of Crittenden, or he would drop out of school. Though the Jobs family was not well off, they used all their savings in 1967 to buy a new home, which would allow Jobs to change schools. The new house was in the better Cupertino School District, Cupertino, California, and was embedded in an environment that was even more heavily populated with engineering families than the Mountain View home. 
The house was declared a historic site in 2013 as it was the first site for Apple Computer and is now owned by Patty and occupied by Jobs' stepmother Marilyn. When he was 13 in 1968, Jobs was given a summer job by Bill Hewlett after Jobs cold called him to ask for parts for an electronics project. He didn't know me at all, but he ended up giving me some parts. And he got me a job that summer working at Hewlett Packard on the line. Assembling frequency counters, well, assembling may be too strong. I was putting in screws. It didn't matter. I was in heaven. Bill Fernandez, a fellow electronics hobbyist who was in jobs grade at Cupertino Junior High, was his first friend after the 1967 move. Fernandez later commented that, for some reason the kids in the 8th grade didn't like Jobs, because they thought he was odd. I was one of his few friends. Fernandez eventually introduced Jobs to 18-year-old electronics was in Homestead High alum Steve Wozniak, who lived across the street from Fernandez. Homestead High the location of the Los Altos home meant that Jobs would be able to attend Homestead High School in Silicon Valley. He began his first year there in late 1968 along with Fernandez. Neither Jobs nor Fernandez came from engineering households and thus decided to enroll in John McCollum's Electronics 1. McCollum and the rebellious Jobs would eventually clash and Jobs began to lose interest in the class. He also had no interest in sports and would later say that he didn't have what it took to be a jock. I was always a loner. He underwent a change during mid-1970. I got stoned. For the first time, I discovered Shakespeare, Dylan Thomas, and all that classic stuff. I read Moby Dick and went back as a junior taking creative writing classes. Jobs also later noted to his official biographer that I started to listen to music a whole lot, and I started to read more outside of just science and technology, Shakespeare, Plato. I loved King Lear. When I was a senior I had this phenomenal app English class. The teacher was this guy who looked like Ernest Hemingway. He took a bunch of us snowshoeing in Yosemite. From that point, Jobs developed two different circles of friends, those who were involved in electronics and engineering and those who were interested in art and literature. These dual interests were particularly reflected during Jobs' senior year as his best friends were Wozniak and his first girlfriend the artistic Homestead Junior Chris Ann Brennan. In 1971 after Wozniak began attending University of California, Berkeley, Jobs would visit him there a few times a week. This experience led him to study in nearby Stanford University's student union. Jobs also decided that rather than join the electronics club, he would put on light shows with a friend for Homestead's avant-garde jazz program. He was described by a Homestead classmate as kind of a brain and kind of a hippie. But he never fit into either group. He was smart enough to be a nerd, but wasn't nerdy. And he was too intellectual for the hippies, who just wanted to get wasted all the time. He was kind of an outsider. In high school everything revolved around what group you were in. And if you weren't in a carefully defined group, you weren't anybody. He was an individual, in a world where individuality was suspect. By his senior year in late 1971, he was taking freshman English class at Stanford and working on a Homestead Underground film project with Chris Ann. In mid-1972, after graduation, and before leaving for Reed College Jobs and Brennan rented a house from their other roommate, Al. During the summer, Brennan, Jobs, and Steve Wozniak found an advertisement posted on the De Anza College bulletin board for a job that required people to dress up as characters from Alice in Wonderland. 
Brennan portrayed Alice while Wozniak, Jobs, and Elle portrayed the White Rabbit and the Mad Hatter. Reed College Later in the year, Jobs enrolled at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Reed was an expensive college which Paul and Clara could ill afford. They were spending much of the life savings on their son's higher education. Brennan remained involved with Jobs while he was at Reed College. She also met his Reed friend Daniel Kotka for the first time. Jobs also became friends with Reed student body president Robert Friedland. Brennan did not have plans to attend college and was supportive of Jobs when he told her he planned to drop out of Reed because he did not want to spend his parents' money on it. He continued to attend by auditing classes, including a course on calligraphy taught by Robert Palladino, but since he was no longer an official student, Brennan stopped visiting him. Jobs later asked her to come and live with him in a house he rented near the Red Campus, but she refused. He had started seeing other women, and she was interested in someone she met in her art class. Brennan speculates that the house was Jobs' attempt to make their relationship monogamous again. In a 2005 commencement speech for Stanford University, Jobs states that during this period, he slept on the floor in friends' dorm rooms, returned Coke bottles for food money, and got weekly free meals at the local Hare Krishna temple. In that same speech, Jobs said, If I had never dropped in on that single calligraphy course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. Pre-Apple in mid-1972, Jobs moved back to the San Francisco Bay Area and was renting his own apartment. Brennan states by this point that their relationship was complicated. I couldn't break the connection and I couldn't commit. Steve couldn't either. Jobs hitchhiked and worked around the West Coast and Brennan would occasionally join him. At the same time, Brennan notes, little by little, Steve and I separated, but we were never able to fully let go. We never talked about breaking up or going our separate ways and we didn't have that conversation where one person says it's over. They continued to grow apart, but Jobs would still seek her out and visit her while she was working in a health food store or as a live-in babysitter. They remained involved with each other while continuing to see other people. In 1973, Steve Wozniak designed his own version of the classic video game Pong. After finishing it, Wozniak gave the board to Jobs, who then took the game down to Atari, Inc. in Los Gatos, California. Atari thought that Jobs had built it and gave him a job as a technician. Atari's co-founder Nolan Bushnell later described him as difficult but valuable, pointing out that he was very often the smartest guy in the room, and he would let people know that. By early 1973, Jobs was living what Brennan describes as a simple life in a Los Gatos cabin, working at Atari, and saving money for his impending trip to India. Brennan visited him twice at the cabin. She states in her memoir that her memories of this cabin consist of Jobs reading Be Here Now, listening to South Indian music, and using a Japanese meditation pillow. Brennan felt that he was more distant and negative toward her. Brennan states in her memoir that she met with Jobs right before he left for India and that he tried to give her a $100 bill that he had earned at Atari. She initially refused to accept it, but eventually accepted the money. Jobs traveled to India in mid-1974 to visit Neem Karoli Baba at his kind she ashram with his reed friend Daniel Kotka in search of spiritual enlightenment. When they got to the Neem Karoli ashram, it was almost deserted, because Neem Karoli Baba had died in September 1973. 
Then they made a long trek up a dry riverbed to an ashram of Haida Khan Babaji in India. They spent a lot of time on bus rides from Delhi to Uttar Pradesh and Himachal Pradesh. After staying for seven months, Jobs left India and returned to the U.S. ahead of Daniel Cocker. Jobs had changed his appearance. His head was shaved and he wore traditional Indian clothing. During this time, Jobs experimented with psychedelics, later calling his LSD experiences one of the two or three most important things he had done in his life. He spent a period at the All One Farm, a commune in Oregon and Brennan joined him there for a period. During this time period, Jobs and Brennan both became practitioners of Zen Buddhism through the Zen master Coburn Chino Otogawa. Jobs was living with his parents again, in their backyard Tulsht which he had converted into a bedroom with a sleeping bag, mat books, a candle, and a meditation pillow. Jobs engaged in lengthy meditation retreats at the Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, the oldest Soto Zen monastery in the U.S. He considered taking up monastic residence at AHG in Japan, and maintained a lifelong appreciation for Zen. Jobs would later say that people around him who did not share his countercultural roots could not fully relate to his thinking. Jobs then returned to Atari and was assigned to create a circuit board for the arcade video game Breakout. According to Bushnell, Atari offered for each TTL chip that was eliminated in the machine. Jobs had little specialized knowledge of circuit board design and made a deal with Wozniak to split the fee evenly between them if Wozniak could minimize the number of chips. Much to the amazement of Atari engineers, Wozniak reduced the TTL count to 46, a design so tight that it was impossible to reproduce on an assembly line. According to Wozniak, Jobs told him that Atari gave them only $700, and that Wozniak's share was thus $350. Wozniak did not learn about the actual bonus until 10 years later, but said that if Jobs had told him about it and explained that he needed the money, Wozniak would have given it to him. Wozniak had designed a low-cost digital blue box to generate the necessary tones to manipulate the telephone network, allowing free long-distance calls. Jobs decided that they could make money selling it. The clandestine sales of the illegal blue boxes went well and perhaps planted the seed in Jobs' mind that electronics could be both fun and profitable. Jobs, in a 1994 interview, recalled that it took six months for him and Wozniak to figure out how to build the blue boxes. Jobs said that if not for the blue boxes, there would have been no Apple. He states it showed them that they could take on large companies and beat them. Apple Jobs and Wozniak attended meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club in 1975. In 1976, Wozniak invented the Apple I computer and showed it to Jobs, who suggested that they sell it. Jobs, Wozniak and Ronald Wayne formed Apple Computer in the garage of Jobs' Los Altos home on Chris Drive. Wayne stayed only a short time, leaving Jobs and Wozniak as the active primary co-founders of the company. A neighbor on Chris Drive recalled Jobs as an odd individual who would greet his clients with his underwear hanging out, barefoot and hippie-like. Another neighbor, Larry Waterland, who had just earned his Ph.D. in chemical engineering at Stanford, recalled dismissing Jobs' budding business, you punched cards, put them in a big deck, he said about the mainframe machines of the time. Steve took me over to the garage. He had a circuit board with a chip on it, a Dumont TV set, a Panasonic cassette tape deck and a keyboard. He said, this is an Apple computer, I said. You've got to be joking, I dismissed the whole idea, Jobs' friend from Reed College, 
and India, Daniel Kotka, recalled that he was the only person who worked in the garage. Was would show up once a week with his latest code. Steve Jobs didn't get his hands dirty in that sense. Cocker also stated that much of the early work took place in Jobs' kitchen, where he spent hours on the phone trying to find investors for the company. They received funding from a then semi-retired Intel product marketing manager and engineer Mike Markula. Scott McNeely, one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, said that Jobs broke a glass age ceiling in Silicon Valley because it created a very successful company at a young age. After she returned from her own journey to India, Brennan visited Jobs at his parents' home, where he was still living. It was during this period that Jobs and Brennan fell in love again. As Brennan noted changes in him that she attributes to Coburn. It was also at this time that Jobs displayed a prototype Apple computer for Brennan and his parents in their living room. Brennan notes a shift in this time period, where the two main influences on Jobs were Apple and Coburn. By the early 1977, she and Jobs would spend time together at her home at Duvernec Ranch in Los Altos, which served as a hostel and environmental education center. Brennan also worked there as a teacher for inner-city children who came to learn about the farm. In 1977, Jobs and Wozniak introduced the Apple II at the West Coast Computer Fair. It was the first consumer product sold by Apple Computer, and was one of the first highly successful mass-produced microcomputer products. It was designed primarily by Steve Wozniak. Jobs oversaw the development of the Apple II's unusual case, and Rod Holt developed the unique power supply. Jobs usually went to work wearing a black long-sleeved mock turtleneck made by St. Croix brand. Levi's 501 blue jeans and New Balance 991 sneakers. He said his choice was inspired by that of Stuart Gemman, a noted applied mathematics professor at Brown University. Jobs told his biographer Walter Isaacson, he came to like the idea of having a uniform for himself, both because of its daily convenience and its ability to convey a signature style. Jobs and Apple became more successful, and his relationship with Brennan grew more complex. In 1977, the success of Apple was now a part of their relationship, and Brennan, Daniel Kotka, and Jobs moved into a house near the Apple office in Cupertino. Brennan eventually took a position in the shipping department at Apple. Brennan's relationship with Jobs was deteriorating as his position with Apple grew, and she began to consider ending the relationship through small changes. In October 1977, Brennan was approached by Rod Holt, who asked her to take a paid apprenticeship designing blueprints for the apples. Both Holt and Jobs felt that it would be a good position for her, given her artistic abilities. Holt was particularly eager that she take the position and puzzled by her ambivalence toward it. Brennan's decision, however, was overshadowed by the fact that she realized she was pregnant and that Jobs was the father. It took her a few days to tell Jobs, whose face, according to Brennan, turned ugly at the news. At the same time, according to Brennan, at the beginning of her third trimester, Jobs said to her, I never wanted to ask that you get an abortion. I just didn't want to do that. He also refused to discuss the pregnancy with her. Brennan herself felt confused about what to do. She was estranged from her mother and afraid to discuss the matter with her father. She also did not feel comfortable with the idea of having an abortion. She chose instead to discuss the matter with Coburn, who encouraged her to have and keep the baby, and pledged his support. Meanwhile, Holt was waiting for her decision on the internship. Brennan states that Jobs continued to encourage her 
to take the internship, stating she could be pregnant and work at Apple. You can take the job. I don't get what the problem is. Brennan, however, notes that she felt so ashamed the thought of my growing belly in the professional environment at Apple, with the child being his while he was unpredictable, in turn being punishing and sentimentally ridiculous. I could not have endured it. Brennan turned down the internship and decided to leave Apple. She stated that Jobs told her, if you give up this baby for adoption, you will be sorry. And, I am never going to help you. Now alone, Brennan was on welfare and cleaning houses to earn money. She would sometimes ask Jobs for money, but he always refused. Brennan hid her pregnancy for as long as she could, living in a variety of homes and continuing her work with Zen meditation. At the same time, according to Brennan, Jobs started to seed people with the notion that I slept around and he was infertile, which meant that this could not be his child. A few weeks before she was due to give birth, Brennan was invited to deliver her baby at the All One Farm in Oregon and she accepted the offer. When Jobs was 23 Brennan gave birth to her baby, Lisa Brennan, on May 17, 1978. Jobs went there for the birth after he was contacted by Robert Friedland, their mutual friend and owner of the All One Farm. While distant, Jobs worked with her on a name for the baby which they discussed while sitting in the fields on a blanket. Brennan suggested the name of Lisa, which Jobs also liked and notes that Jobs was very attached to the name of Lisa while he was also publicly denying paternity. She would discover later that, during this time, Jobs was preparing to unveil a new kind of computer that he wanted to give a female name. She also stated that she never gave him permission to use the baby's name for a computer and he hid the plans from her. Jobs also worked with his team to come up with the phrase, local integrated software architecture, as an alternative explanation for the Apple Lisa. Brennan would come under intense criticism from Jobs, who claimed that, she doesn't want money, she just wants me. According to Brennan, Apple's Mike Scott wanted Jobs to give her money, while other Apple executives advised him to ignore me if I, if I tried to go after a paternity settlement. When Jobs denied paternity, a DNA test to establish him as Lisa's father, it required him to give Brennan $385 a month in addition to returning the welfare money she had received. Jobs gave her $500 a month at the time when Apple went public, and Jobs became a millionaire. Brennan worked as a waitress in Palo Alto. Later, Brennan agreed to give an interview with Michael Moritz for Time magazine for its Time Person of the Year special, released on January 3, 1983, in which she discussed her relationship with Jobs. Rather, then named Jobs the Person of the Year, the magazine named the computer the Machine of the Year. In the issue, Jobs questioned the reliability of the paternity test. Jobs responded by arguing that 28% of the male population of the United States could be the father. Time also noted that the baby girl and the machine on which Apple has placed so much hope for the future share the same name of Lisa. Jobs was worth a million dollars when he was 23 in 1978, 10 million when he was 24, and over 100 million when he was 25. He was also one of the youngest people ever to make the Forbes list of the nation's richest people, and one of only a handful to have done it themselves without inherited wealth. In 1978, Apple recruited Mike Scott from National Semiconductor to serve as CEO for what turned out to be several turbulent years. In 1983, Jobs lured John Scully away from Pepsi-Cola to serve as Apple's CEO, asking, Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want a chance? 
to change the world. In 1982, Jobs bought an apartment in the two top floors of the San Remo, a Manhattan building with a politically progressive reputation. Although he never lived there, he spent years renovating it with the help of I.M. Pei. In 2003, he sold it to U2 singer Bono. In 1984, Jobs bought the Jackaling House and estate, and resided there for a decade. After that, he leased it out for several years until 2000 when he stopped maintaining the house, allowing exposure to the weather to degrade it. In 2004, Jobs received permission from the town of Woodside to demolish the house in order to build a smaller contemporary styled one. After a few years in court, the house was finally demolished in 2011, a few months before he died. In early 1984, Apple introduced the Macintosh, which was based on the Lisa. The following year, Apple aired a Super Bowl television commercial titled, 1984, at Apple's annual shareholders meeting. On January 24, 1984, an emotional Jobs introduced the Macintosh to a wildly enthusiastic audience. Andy Hertzfeld described the scene as, pandemonium. Despite the fanfare, the expensive Macintosh was a hard sell. Shortly after its release in 1985, Bill Gates' then developing company, Microsoft, threatened to stop developing Mac applications unless it was granted a license for the Mac operating system software. Microsoft was developing its graphical user interface for DOS, which it was calling Windows and didn't want Apple to sue over the similarities between the Windows GUI and the Mac interface. Scully granted Microsoft the license which later led to problems for Apple. In addition, cheap IBM PC clones that ran on Microsoft software and had a graphical user interface began to appear. Although the Macintosh preceded the clones, it was far more expensive, so, through the late 80s, the Windows user interface was getting better and better and was thus taking increasingly more share from Apple. Windows-based IBM PC clones also led to the development of additional GUIs such as IBM's Top Viewer Digital Research Gem, and thus, the graphical user interface was beginning to be taken for granted, undermining the most apparent advantage of the Mac. It seemed clear as the 80s wound down that Apple can go it alone indefinitely against the whole IBM clone market. Scully's and Jobs' respective visions for the company greatly differed. The former favored opened architecture computers like the Apple II, sold to education, small business, and home markets less vulnerable to IBM. Jobs wanted the company to focus on the closed architecture Macintosh as a business alternative to the IBM PC. President and CEO Scully had little control over chairman of the board Jobs Macintosh division. It and the Apple II division operated like separate companies, duplicating services. Although its products provided 85% of Apple's sales in early 1985, the company's January 1985 annual meeting did not mention the Apple II division or employees. Many left including Wozniak, who stated that the company had been going in the wrong direction for the last five years and sold most of his stock. The Macintosh's failure to defeat the PC strengthened Scully's position in the company. In May 1985, Scully, encouraged by Arthur Rock, decided to reorganize Apple and proposed a plan to the board that would remove Jobs from the Macintosh group and put him in charge of new product development. This move would effectively render Jobs powerless within Apple. In response, Jobs then developed a plan to get rid of Scully and take over Apple. However, Jobs was confronted after the plan was leaked and he said that he would leave Apple. The board declined his resignation and asked him 
to reconsider. Scully also told Jobs that he had all of the votes needed to go ahead with the reorganization. A few months later, on September 17, 1985, Jobs submitted a letter of resignation to the Apple board. Five additional senior Apple employees also resigned and joined Jobs in his new venture. Next. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.